Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we're going to keep talking about that Holy Spirit. We had Pentecost last week, and I didn't get a Pentecost podcast recorded. And yet, we're supposed to live Pentecost every day. We're supposed to live Pentecost. And so I thought that this week I would um, kind of try to inflame your heart on fire to take those gifts and those graces and the virtues and the fruits that we were filled with last weekend and to launch them into your daily lives. Um, so we're going to start with a prayer, and I'm going to use a lot of um, writing from um, Archbishop Luis Martinez. I think he's a blessed. He was um, the spiritual director for Conchita, Blessed Conchita in Mexico. And um, his writing is so rich, and especially on the Holy Spirit. So we're going to kind of pull from that. But we'll start with a prayer, and then we'll get going. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in us a fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we will be recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sorry for that mistake. But I thought we would just call on the Holy Spirit, and when we call on him in song, it's even more powerful than calling on him just with our words, right? And so we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times people focus on the Holy Spirit right at Pentecost and then they forget about it. They go on to what they call ordinary time. Is anything ever really ordinary? <laughs> In the old calendar of the church, they would actually call this um, 
like the time of Pentecost. And it was a time dedicated not to ordinary things, but to the Holy Spirit and kind of living with that Holy Spirit every day of our lives. And um, I think that that's something that we've lost in today's world um, in all of the noise is the action of the Holy Spirit in everyday life. You know, I think about the creation of a soul and of a body within the womb of their mother, right? And the, it's an intimate act between humanity and the divinity and the Holy Spirit, who is the life-giving presence of God, right? When the Father breathed into Adam and Eve, or he breathes into a little body being formed within his mother's womb, he's giving them a soul and that breath of God, right? Breathe on me, breath of God. That breath of God is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can't do anything without giving life, right? So like today we have um, the advantage of being able to like, um, you can put a camera on a flower or on a seed and then you fast forward the speed and you can watch what it looks like to have it actually grow when really it can take weeks and months and sometimes years. Think about that um, in the life of a soul. The Holy Spirit is constantly working. He's constantly making us grow. He's constantly um, forming us to be that image of God that we were created to be and that we lost by sin, both our actual sin and original sin, right? Kind of pulled us away from what God originally intended for us. And the Holy Spirit wants to bring us back. And so if you could have that like time lapse, that fast forwarding of the camera of our lives, then we would see more profoundly that work, the, the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. But because we live um, on this side of eternity, we don't see things in that eyes, in the, you know, the sight of God with his eternal vision on things, at least at this point, maybe in heaven we'll see everything as he sees but because of that, we don't often take note of the Holy Spirit's active presence within our lives. And, you know, Pope John Paul II used to pray that he would never let one little inspiration of the Holy Spirit go ignored in his life. In fact, when he was young, he was given a prayer to the Holy Spirit that he prayed every day, even as a saintly pope. He prayed that same prayer for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that he wouldn't ever ignore one little um, inspiration or, or gift of his. And that should be our, um, our prayer as well. You know, the first thing that the Holy Spirit did was create the world, right? It says that a wind blew over the waters. That was the Holy Spirit. And then he gave life. But like I said, just like he did it at the beginning, he continues to do it every day. We were created with the Holy Spirit and in the Holy Spirit. And yet today he recreated Mary Klaska in a new way to make me a little bit more like God and a little bit less fallen because I've given him that permission, right? And, you know, he might be working in an area of your life on a temptation. Say you're very tempted to greed or materialism, to vanity, to pride, to lust, to anger, whatever it is. The Holy Spirit is chipping away at you every day to help you conquer those vices, whatever it is that you struggle with, and to fill you with the opposite virtue. So maybe you're real selfish or prideful, right? You just think you're the best thing next to chocolate. Well, you know, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is trying to not like um, clobber you and say you're a terrible person because you're not. <coughs> But he is trying to take away your self-absorption and to give you that spirit of humility, of, of knowing who you are in goodness and in fallenness before the eyes of God and how you can grow in that virtue and just magnify God, right? Magnify his love and his truth and his beauty in this world. You know, maybe you really struggle with anger and you, you explode at your husband and your children or, you know, maybe you're a priest and you don't have any patience with your penitence in the confessional. Every day, 
God is giving you a new grace through the Holy Spirit to grow in that virtue of patience and of meekness, of gentleness, and to take away the opposite vice. The Holy Spirit is constantly recreating us. The same way that your body, when it's cut, you can see how your body, you know, immediately sends blood to clean out that wound and to start facilitating the healing of that wound. And then a scab comes and then it's, you know, cleaned over. You can't see your wound healed, but one day it's suddenly healed, right? I bet you could in a time lapse. You could if you had a camera on it the whole time. But in the same way, there's wounds that have happened to our hearts that can be from our own sin or from other people's sin against us. And the Holy Spirit is um, constantly sending the blood of Christ to our hearts to heal them, to make them new, to make us back into that image of his love that um, we were created to be at the beginning. And he's always giving life in that way. The Holy Spirit does this through his gifts, right? We know that there are seven major gifts of the Holy Spirit, but there's many more than just that. There's, you know, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, right judgment, courage and fortitude, piety, wonder and awe, right? And then there's the fruits that come along too. There's just plain virtue. There's humility, there's gentleness and strength. There's chastity and modesty. There's faith, hope, and love. There's a, a long suffering. There's all sorts of gifts that he gives us a patience, a goodness, just kindness, right? A generosity um, that he wants for us to use every day in our lives. And then there's also those special charisms that, you know, are a little bit more of, um, uh, the fireworks of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I always say this, if you ever follow my daily rosaries, right? How, you know, at Pentecost, he came with the boom and the bang, right? He came with fire and a wind and he came with, you know, manifestation of tongues and all these converts and this fiery courage and the apostles went out, right? But the Holy Spirit also is a quiet spirit that speaks in silence very often. And that's the way that he guided the, um, the prophets in the Old Testament. That's how, you know, Elijah, he hid in a cave. He was waiting for God to pass by and he didn't come in a fire and a tornado and all of this wind and storm. He came in a still, small voice. You know, for Esther, when, you know, she was having to defend her people, God didn't speak to her. The words that she spoke to the king, you know, in some big visual revelation, apparition, voice from heaven. She prayed and fasted and then her heart was inspired with the silent word of the Holy Spirit that moved the heart of a king. You know, when you look at the history of the church, very often the Holy Spirit spoke through the saints too in a silent way. It was a quiet knowing a gnawing that they couldn't let go, where they knew something was God's will. And it's kind of hard when the Holy Spirit speaks that way, because if he appears in a vision with great miracles and everyone listens, right? But when he speaks in that surety of your soul, it's something that you can't prove to other people, but it's actually more firmly um there's a firmer surety that that's actually from God. That the hiddenness and the opaqueness of his presence is actually a sign of his presence because it's mystical. That word means hidden, right? So like, look at how the Holy Spirit worked in um, Our Lady's life. We didn't hear about the, like this big saint that everybody knew and loved named Mary of Nazareth. She was this unknown, hidden, obscure handmaiden. And when the angel came, he said, Hail Mary, full of grace. She was full of the Holy Spirit completely and totally already. And yet it was in a silent way. And it was the Holy Spirit that led her to sing the Magnificat when she got to Elizabeth. It was just a song bubbling up in her heart that was full of divine love. And you look at St. Joseph, 
Yes, the Holy Spirit led him in dreams, right? Angels came to him in dreams. But in his everyday decisions over Mary and Jesus, leading the Holy Family, where he had to step in for God the Father and say, like, what is the most prudent thing? How can we provide? What sh where should we go? You know, what should I say at the census? Where should I look to provide for them? The Holy Spirit worked in Joseph's life in a very hidden way. And yet that hiddenness was profound. You may have one of these big charisms of the Holy Spirit where he manifests himself. My dad has had a powerful gift of healing since I was in junior high, probably. I mean, cancer and like all these huge things happening where people have been healed for years and years, right? But what's more profound than the major healings that you see physically where people like get up and walk is when the Holy Spirit would work through him in a hidden way to nudge those he met to go to confession when they hadn't been in years and years. You know, the Holy Spirit may give you a gift of prophesying, right? Or speaking in tongues, of preaching. But the gift that's going to most profoundly affect those around you is when the life that you live, you can preach very beautifully about kindness. But what was the tone of voice that you used with your employee or with the sales lady, with the people who help you with your house, with the people who you work for? You can preach about kindness, and that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. But a greater gift is living it in every look, in every word, in every action. You know, you can teach people about forgiveness, but do you have bitterness in your heart? Have you forgiven not only the, you know, the estranged in-law that did something to you, but maybe, you know, the neighbor that spoke a mean word? You know, it might not seem as big of a deal because they're not as close to you intimately. But do you complain about them in an annoying way or do you just forgive them and go on? The Holy Spirit helps us to recognize our own sin and also to forgive other people's sin, right? Jesus, when he breathed on the apostles, he said, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you forgive are forgiven. The Holy Spirit works powerfully yet hiddenly in the sacrament of reconciliation, sometimes you might go to confession and you'll have this, this waft of peace and you'll feel like you're on cloud nine and, you know, it'll be really like experiencing in your senses the forgiveness of God. But more often in your life, you'll go to confession and you won't feel anything. And the Holy Spirit is still working to perfect you just in a more hidden way, right? The Holy Spirit wants to live in our lives and be active, but not always with that boom and that bang of the big charisms. They're important. That's why God gives us them, right? I mean, if he gives you, you know, a gift of exhortation to really encourage people, then when you get a phone call and you're tired, you shouldn't hang up the phone on the person. You should talk to them and exhort them right? Try to encourage them in their faith. And yet, realize that the greatest gifts of the Holy Spirit are not going to be visible to other people. They're not going to be when people say, wow, you really helped me. You're so, you know, on fire or whatever. It's going to be those moments that are kind of between you and God. When you choose to do what's right, when nobody else sees it, recognizes it, or appreciates it. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. St. Francis of Assisi used to say the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of suffering, of being united to Christ crucified. And I'll talk about that in a minute when I share some of this writing from Archbishop Louise. But the Holy Spirit wants to unite us to Christ, conform us to Christ. Only then will we fully be who we were created to be. And in being conformed to Christ, we have to be conformed to Christ crucified. That's going to purify us. It's going to take away that which blocks the action of God in our lives. And it'll make us more like God, right? More in his image. 
more of a reflection of Jesus and even of Our Lady who perfectly reflects the Trinity. And so it'll be in that way that we'll, um, we'll grow in holiness most profoundly. It'll be when the Holy Spirit comes and unites you to the cross. The saints talk about the you know, dark night of the soul. That's a great gift and movement of the Holy Spirit. The greatest act of the Holy Spirit is an action of love. St. John of the Cross said that one pure act of love done by you or by me, one truly authentic, pure act of love. And it has to be something in cooperation fully with the Holy Spirit because he is love. He's the love between the Father and the Son. But one act of love does more for the entire church even if they don't see it, say I'm alone in my apartment, but I'm doing a pure, holy act of love. It does more to build up the entire church than, you know, a lifetime of action, of feeding the poor, of preaching the gospel. Because it's the love that conforms me to Christ, and I'm part of the body of Christ, so it lifts up the whole body of Christ. It places us all in that furnace of love. So the Holy Spirit is love, and yet his greatest gift to us is that of authentic love. What does it look like, a pure act of love? Well, St. Paul says love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It's one of those things that authentic love is one of those things that you almost can't describe because it's so divine. But when you see it in another person, you know it. I was talking to a six-year-old the other day, and they were talking about one of their friends. And they said, you know, you can see in the look in this little girl's eyes, Miss Mary, that she's a good person. She would never do something wrong. So this little six-year-old could see in another child's eyes the presence of love. She couldn't explain it. That's because the Holy Spirit was alive and active in her friend. That's what we're called to do. When Christ says, I am the light of the world, and I call you to shed the light, you know, to not hide your light, which is my light, under a bushel basket, but to place it up and to shine. How do we shine the light of Christ? By being full of the Holy Spirit and having nothing in us to block his action. Making sure that we're rid of sin and the effects of sin, right? So I want to share a little bit about the Holy Spirit from Archbishop Luis, and it's from his book, The Sanctifier. It's so beautiful. By no means can I um, share it all. But there are some excerpts that I kind of, as I started to look through it, just because it's Pentecost, I thought I need to share this with my listeners because um, it's an aspect of the Holy Spirit that's very deep and profound and beautiful and often kind of passed over in this world because even um, many times, you know, homilies at church and things are a little more superficial because people in the world are kind of superficial. So you got to talk on that level to meet them. But it doesn't grasp that depth that the saints got. And, and Archbishop Luis kind of goes to the gut of it all, right? He says, to the artist of souls, God is an artist of souls. Sanctification and possession are the same act. If you're sanctified or you're possessed by God, it's the same act. For sanctification is the work of love, and love is possession. The very lowest degree of sanctity demands that the Holy Spirit dwell in our souls. So if you even want a tiny bit of holiness, the Holy Spirit must dwell within you and must possess them. While supreme sanctity, the highest holiness, is the supreme possession that the Holy Spirit attains in the soul. 
its full and perfect possession of love. So the goal of the spiritual life is to be completely possessed by authentic divine love. Infinite love is not a passing visitor who pays us a call and then goes away. And, and this kind of love is not something we do just for a moment. Instead, infinite love establishes in us his permanent dwelling. He lives in intimate union with our souls as their eternal guest. So when you are possessed by God's love, by the Holy Spirit, it's not momentarily. It's permanent. It's eternal. The soul's delightful guest does not remain idle in his intimate sanctuary. When the Holy Spirit comes to possess you, he's not idle. He is fire and he is light, as the church calls him. He hardly takes possession of the soul before his beneficent influence extends itself to the whole being and begins with divine activity, its work of transformation. So think about a bonfire, a bonfire outside. If you throw something into it, not just a little bit is caught on fire, the whole item is consumed. So when the Holy Spirit comes to us as fire and as light and as love, there's not one aspect of our being that's not consumed by that love. Every faculty, our memory, our reason, our vision, our hearing, our speaking, our skin, our actions, our will, our desires, our fears, everything is transformed in this fire and light of divine love. It's incredible. The Holy Spirit lives in us, not only to possess us, but also to be possessed by us, to be ours. Love must possess as well as be possessed. So God gives his gift to the Holy Spirit and he wants to possess us, but he wants us to receive that and to possess him. We're not supposed to just be the beloved of God, but the lover of God. Love is two way. Because it's not just God's will to love us acting upon us, but it's our will to respond and accept that love and return it. That makes this fire of divine love, the possession of the Holy Spirit in the heart, full and complete. It's the characteristic of love to give gifts. But the first gift, the gift par excellence, is love itself. So the Holy Spirit wants to give you his gifts of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. But those all come from this pool, this ocean of love itself that comes to dwell in the soul when you allow him to, right? Possession is proper to love. In its first stage, it's a desire of possession. Perfect love is the joy of possession. It's when you burst into song like Our Lady with the Magnificat saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. That joy of possession is the fullness of the Holy Spirit's love dwelling within you. It's a love that's, con that's consummated in the abyss of total possession. In earthly love, our possession is inconsistent and imperfect. When we just like, you look at a husband and wife that really love each other in an earthly way, not a divine way. It's imperfect and it's inconsistent. They might, you know, be really in love with their spouse at 9 a.m. And by 11, they're having a mental affair with the neighbor. It's not consistent and faithful. 
But when divine love is in the middle, it's perfect and it's consistent and it just grows more and more. In divine love, the one who is loved is necessarily possessed and with a more profound intimacy than we can know. God knows us more intimately than we could know anything. And that knowledge itself is a love. You know, you might know your brother, but you don't like him or you judge him or there's something. It's not a knowledge of love. But God, every aspect of what he knows about us, possesses us with love which is why he can be all forgiving and all merciful, even when we don't behave the way we should. God doesn't want us just to accept that between his heart and ours, but to share it with other people. Our knowledge of people should be a knowledge of love. It should be a knowledge led by the Holy Spirit of love that helps them grow in love that gives life to them. It's our love of people that gives life to them. And you might say, oh, that's too deep, you know, but it's not. When you're in line at the grocery store and the clerk is fumbling over things because he's really tired and he makes a mistake on your change, you can know him and what he's done in love and give him life by smiling patiently and forgiving him. Our knowledge of people must give them life and must bestow love on them. And we can do that by the Holy Spirit being at the center of our relationships. God knows and loves us with an intimacy beyond our, our capability of comprehending. And God's love is unchanging. And when our love comes to reflect God's love, then it's the same. It does the same things that his perfect love does to us, right? So like I just explained. It's only the three persons of the Holy Trinity dwelling within our hearts that can help us to imitate this love. To be transformed into Jesus is the greatest work of the Holy Spirit. It's a work of love. And the more that we allow his love to give life and to live within us, the more we're transformed into Jesus. And when that happens, we share completely in the gift of wisdom. And this gift of wisdom has its roots in charity. It's a light that springs forth from love that grows when love increases, that reaches the fullness of its splendor when charity has attained its perfect development. One who possesses the gift of wisdom sees because he loves. Love can help you to see another person differently than you would humanly see or humanly judge with the eyes of your mind. Love helps us to see and know the other person as God does. He knows divine things because he's intimately united to them, because he savors and enjoys them in an ineffable way. He sees because he looks through the eyes of his beloved, which is Jesus. You know, in scripture, it says when they're talking about um, Samuel looking to anoint David, you know, he said, not like humans do I judge, but God, he judges, he looks at the heart. And we're called to look at people, not as a human, as, as humans do and judge, but to look at them as God does, to look at the heart. You could say, how can I do that? I don't know somebody's heart. The closer you're united to Jesus and his divine love, the more he can reveal to you about another person's heart and help you to see them as he sees them, to love them. To see them as God does means to love them as God does, to know them as God does. 
And St. Thomas Aquinas talks about this saying, infused wisdom is a gift from the Holy Spirit. It's not a cause, but an effect of charity. To the degree that you love is the degree that the Holy Spirit can diffuse his wisdom, his divine wisdom upon you. It's so beautiful. This whole book is so beautiful. The Holy Spirit enters into the most interior, most interior part of our being, and he possesses us. He lets himself be possessed by us. And in an embrace of divine love, he produces in our souls the radiant transformation that he desires. How do we continue to be recreated in the Holy Spirit? By allowing the Holy Spirit to possess us, to embrace us, and embracing him back. That transforms us automatically. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us by directing all of our activities with the sweetness of love and the efficacy of omnipotence. So the closer that we are to the Holy Spirit, the more we're one with his love, the sweeter we will embody that love in the world and the more omnipotent, powerful, will be our actions and our words. Have you ever been in a situation where you said something very simple, but it completely transformed another person? I think about um, the work that I'm doing in the Middle East right now, right? And I get these letters all the time about how my books have changed people. And like, I'll get these witnesses where they, you know, you have a man who's abusing his wife, forced his daughter to have an abortion, you know, completely disrespects women. And my translator shows him my book, The Holiness of Womanhood, and reads him an excerpt. And suddenly, the entire man's life is changed. And he stops abusing his wife. He decides not to force his daughter to have an abortion. And he becomes a promoter of women's dignity in the Middle East. It's not my words themselves People have been saying these words for many years, but it's the Holy Spirit present within that book that's making the man change. It's the Holy Spirit in the prayers of all these people praying for this ministry that's doing it. The Holy Spirit comes with a sweetness of love and in an omnipotent power so that you can say a word, don't abuse women. And it does nothing to a person. And then you say it with that power of the Holy Spirit's love. And it completely changes the other person. It's so important to always speak and act in love. The Holy Spirit alone can penetrate the hidden sanctuary of the soul, the enclosed garden. And so only he can move us and make our words and our actions efficacious in that way. To love, love. The Holy Spirit is love incarnate. It's the love between the Father and the Son that's incarnate in a third person. To love, love is to live with him. It's to allow ourselves to be possessed by him. It's to impregnate ourselves with his divine fire and to let ourselves be consumed by it. At first, that fire is hidden in the depth of the soul under the ashes of our own wretchedness. Our heart is God's, but the greater part of our thoughts and acts escape his divine loving dominion. The soul has, as it were, the principle of the presence of God, but it's not yet developed and our spirit wanders among creatures without ever fixing itself completely upon God. But love like fire is absorbent. Little by little, it extends its sweet demands until it pervades our whole being 
with its victorious influence. Each day our thoughts and acts get near and near to love's source until the thought of God and his loving presence becomes a divine obsession. You're called to be divinely obsessed with the Holy Spirit, with love. To be divinely absorbed and obsessed in a possession of the Holy Spirit. Is not love the obsession that enslaves all of our faculties, that absorbs our lives, admits no rival, and is satisfied with nothing less than our whole being? What a mysterious thing this love of the Holy Spirit is. Nothing is so strong and nothing so gentle. It is death and life. It ruthlessly kills all thoughts that do not correspond to its unique thought. It kills all affections that are not fused in its unique flame. It, and all acts that are not the pedestal of its greatness. When it destroys, it builds. When it kills, it gives life, new life, full and fruitful. When love, the Holy Spirit, has accomplished his work, there is perfect harmony in the human soul. All is united. All is blended in its marvelous unity. Therefore, for one who loves God perfectly, it's imperative to live in his presence. When our eyes do not behold the beloved everywhere, our thoughts do not go to him as the sunflower turns to the sun. When our heart does not rest in presence of the beloved or does not search for him with torturing anxiety when he seems to go away, when all the strength of our being does not throw itself upon the divine beloved as the impetus torrent that rushes toward the ocean, then love has not yet attained its perfect development. So the goal is that we become completely possessed and absorbed by the love of God. And to do this, it's necessary to empty our soul so the divine spirit can enter. When God wishes to fill a heart with his greatness, all that is created must go out of it. This emptiness is demanded by the Holy Spirit who aspires to fullness of possession. It's required by the holy ex, ex it's required by the holy exigencies of a love strong as death, which separates and mercilessly roots out everything else from the soul and leaves a profound and delightful solitude of wis of union. If love separates, it's in order to unite. If it roots out, it's in order to plant. If it empties, it is to fill. If it puts a soul in solitude, it is to bring plentitude. Those who love should be left alone to look at each other without interference, to love without disturbance, to speak without witnesses, to pour out their hearts in isolation in the most pure and intimate union. That's how we're called to be with the Holy Spirit. Think about the importance of solitude between a husband and a wife, right? Who want to share that intimacy. Or think about the importance of solitude in a confessional where you're bearing your soul to God through the priest. Solitude is important for the divine mystery to take place. Think about the importance of that solitude and silence after you receive communion. So when the Holy Spirit seems like he's drawn you into solitude and silence, it's not a punishment. It's a call to perfect union with his presence. Charity joins us closely to the Holy Spirit and it puts us in contact with the divine flame the unique source of holiness. Who would not burn if led into a glowing furnace? 
Who can escape being sanctified if he throws himself into the very essence of sanctity? I think about all of this in light of like my confirmation. I wish my confirmation formation had been like this, Archbishop Louise. You know, what if people truly understood the depth of, um, of holiness that we're given in that union with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in our, in our confirmations? And it talks about, he talks about how we're called to surrender ourselves, almost like a slave to love, to the Holy Spirit. To love is to disappear, to efface oneself to the point of transformation into and fusion with the beloved. The sweet um, abandonment to all the movements of love is the characteristic mark of true devotion to the Holy Spirit. To love this divine spirit is to let ourselves be taken along by him, just like a feather is carried in wind. To let ourselves be possessed by him, as a dry branch is possessed by a fire that burns it. To let ourselves be animated by him, as the sensitive strings of a lyre take life from the artist's touch. The degrees of this abandonment are degrees not only of love, but of Christian perfection, the height of which is characterized precisely by the extension and constancy of the movements of the spirit in the soul he possesses. So the more constant the Holy Spirit is working within your life, within your soul, the greater degree of sanctity you possess. You know, so if you only let the Holy Spirit in for five minutes in the morning when you're praying, then you're going to reach a lower degree of sanctity than if you stop every hour on the hour and pray to him and try to unite yourself to him. And even that would be less than one of the saints who is completely consumed by the Holy Spirit at all times and all places. Like John Paul the Great, who said, let me not ever Ignore one of the smallest inspirations that you give to me, Holy Spirit. St. John of the Cross often taught this truth, where he said the soul, like the true daughter of God that it now is, is moved wholly by the Spirit of God. Even as St. Paul says, they that are moved by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So the understanding of the soul is now the understanding of God. Its will is the will of God. Its memory is the memory of God. Its delight is the delight of God. The substance of the soul, although it's not the substance of God, for into this it cannot be changed, is nevertheless united in him and absorbed in him and is thus God by participation in God which comes to pass in this perfect state of the spiritual life. So beautiful. There's so much of this I have to pass over. When the Holy Spirit fills a soul with light to help him penetrate the mystery of the cross, which is the greatest work of the Holy Spirit, right? He also enkindles in that soul an ardent and passionate love for suffering. Why did the saints love suffering? Because they, the Holy Spirit led them in a knowledge of suffering and a love for it because it conformed them to Jesus crucified. Philosophy itself will never teach us to love pain. Only eternal love of the Holy Spirit that filled the heart of Jesus and united him to the cross can infuse the same love into our souls. Before pain can be loved, it must be transformed into love. And Jesus alone has succeeded in doing this. To love the cross, we must see Jesus on it. Understand the personal and indestructible ties that bind him to it. To love the cross we must experience the sweet and strong attraction 
that Jesus crucified exercises over souls. As he himself promised, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all things to myself. Man, abandoned to himself, hates nothing so much as pain. Where the fire of the Holy Spirit burns within his soul, there's nothing he loves so intensely as pain because it unites him to Jesus crucified. Let us remember the incomprehensible aspirations of the saints, the irrepressible longing of St. Ignatius the martyr for the supreme sacrifice, the disconcerting alternatives of St. Teresa of Jesus, who said to suffer or to die, the eagerness of the Virgin of Lisieux to embrace in her loving heart all the martyrdoms and pain. Madness? Undoubtedly a divine madness of a God in love who willed to die for man and who left on earth the precious seed of this sublime folly. Is love itself perhaps not madness? Do not all the bold deeds of genius and heroism appear to be madness? Does not all that falls outside of the narrow mold of mediocrity seem madness? There are some who never fail to proclaim that saints are abnormal. They believe that human normality consists in living to its fullness the animal life of man, ennobled with its refinements of what they call culture, right? They don't understand the madness of the cross. Against this modern paganism, there is no other remedy than the Holy Spirit pouring himself copiously into souls, renewing the face of the earth, revealing the mystery of pain, and kindling in hearts the rarest, most intense of all loves, the supreme love that saves the love of suffering. The Holy Spirit who communicates the science of the cross and infuses love for it into souls also, also gives to chosen souls a participation in it, right? The greatest gift of the Holy Spirit is to be united to Christ crucified. According to his loving designs, Jesus himself offered his sacrifice under the divine influence of the Holy Spirit. It is not our sacrifice itself that is value and merit, greatness and power to glorify God. It's the power and the life of these sacrifices we make is in the love that impregnates and inspires it. And the love that impregnates and inspires our sacrifice is the Holy Spirit incarnate. St. Paul said that martyrdom itself avails to nothing if you don't have love. Is not hell the greatest suffering? Why is it so sterile and desolate and full of despair? Because love is gone forever from that accursed place. If those eternal pains glorify God, it's because the former love of the damned, now turned to hate, still gives glory to him. For sacrifice to have value, it must be the fruit of love, be the fruit of Holy Spirit. To have infinite value, it must be the fruit of infinite love. Therefore, Jesus offered himself through the Holy Spirit, the personal love of God, and all the souls who wish to share in the sacrifice of Jesus, all who wish like him to offer themselves to the Father, must offer themselves through the Holy Spirit. It is he who inspires all holy emulations, and all fruitful martyrdoms. He enfolds our poor sorrows in the infinite sorrows of Jesus. He mingles our blood with his divine blood and nails us to the cross with the divine victim. He fuses our hearts with Jesus's divine heart. Thus the Holy Spirit teaches the mystery of the cross. He teaches us how to love it. He makes us participate in the sacrifice of Jesus, by revealing the Father to us, he reveals the mystery of the cross, 
And by our participation in it, he makes us glorify the Father. There's so much that I could read. But I think that we should end here. And I think that we should just take a few minutes before I end this podcast and to pray to the Holy Spirit together. Pray that he may take our love and our union with him, our possession of him in response to his desire to possess us in full to that next level. We ask Mary, who is the full and complete spouse of the Holy Spirit, St. Joseph, who is led by him in everything, to intercede for us, to apply the merits of the blood of Christ upon every part of our being, to take away anything and everything in us that blocks the fullness of the consumption of the Holy Spirit within our souls. We ask the Holy Spirit to live in us fully, to make us into little Christs into this world. We pray that he opens up not only some of his gifts, but all of his gifts and all of his fruits, all of his charisms in more and more profound ways. We ask that his love become the center of everything, the source of our sacrifice, the igniter of our desires, the fulfillment of our will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by the means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Amen. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.